Would you pray with me? Come, Holy Spirit. Help us to listen for the word of God that will minister to us in our need this morning. Help us to be encouraged by the story of Jesus' life and ministry. And help us to recognize how the resurrected Christ wants to live in our hearts and minister to us and to others through us. May we become the good soil that Jesus spoke of. The ones who, when they hear the word, hold it fast in an honest and good heart and bear fruit with patient endurance. We pray in the name of Jesus the Christ, the one who heals the sick and restores life. Amen. Retired United States Marine Corps General Charles Krulak tells of the time when he, as a non-believer, was first confronted with the testimony of a person fully committed to Jesus Christ. Krulak writes, many years ago I was a young second lieutenant at basic school where officers learn about honor, courage, and commitment. At that time in my life I thought I was a cross between John Wayne and Tom Cruise. I shared a room with another married officer named John Listerman. John was a wonderful human being. He exuded goodness. If I had asked for his arm, he would have asked where do you want me to cut it off? At the wrist? At the elbow? John was a Christian. That meant nothing to me other than, gee, what a nice guy. This Christian stuff must be pretty good. Upon graduating from basic school, John and I went to Camp Pendleton, California, where we joined the same battalion preparing to go to Vietnam. And I saw another side of John Listerman. He was a tremendous leader aggressive and technically proficient. People loved him. He was committed to his troops and his troops were committed to him. He was a Marine's Marine. On a December morning in 1965, John and I went to war. John Listerman's war lasted one day. We were on patrol moving down a trail through the jungle. We came around a corner and we ran into an ambush. John took the first round right in his kneecap. As his kneecap burst, the crack was so loud it sounded like a mortar exploding. It threw him up in the air, and as he was dropping, the second round hit him right below the heart. It exited out his side. I was wounded also, but nowhere near as badly. I saw John about 30 meters away on his back, his leg blown off. I crawled up to him and I wanted to say, are you okay? Can I do anything? But before I could say anything, John's head turned toward me and he said, how are you doing, Tucker? Are you okay? I said, yes, John, I'm okay. He said, are my men safe? I said, John, your people are okay. At that point, he turned his head, looked to the sky and repeated over and over, thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Thank you for caring for my people. Thank you for caring for me. General Krulak states, I was dumbfounded. John Listerman and Charles Krulak were both evacuated, and Krulak later became a Christian. When we find ourselves in a desperate situation, we discover how deep the roots of our faith truly are. And if our roots are deep, in those moments, we may lead others to deep faith as well. We've been studying Jesus' life and ministry according to the Gospel of Luke. And in the first passage of chapter 8, Jesus tells a parable about a sower, seeds, and different kinds of soil. He goes on to explain that he, Jesus, is the sower. The, his words are the seeds, and those who hear his words represent the different kinds of soil. Then the rest of chapter 8 tells stories that illustrate people who represent different kinds of soil. In one passage, Jesus and his disciples are caught in a storm on the lake. And the disciples fear for their lives. Jesus calms the storm. But the disciples still question who Jesus is, that the wind and the water obey him. 
In that passage, the disciples seem to represent the rocky soil because they hear the word, receive it with joy, but have no root. They believe only for a while, and in a time of testing, they fall away. In the next passage, Jesus goes to the country of the Gerasenes to release a man held captive to many demons. Even though the people of that area witness the change that Jesus brings to the man released from the demons, they ask Jesus to leave them. These people represent the soil on the path, the hard soil, the ones who hear the word but do not receive it. Then the devil comes and takes away the word from their hearts. They do not believe and they are not saved. Today we will look at the last passage in chapter 8. As we do, notice what kind of soil the main characters of this passage represent. We will read Luke 8, 40 through 56. If you'd like to follow along in your Bible, Luke 8, 40 through 56, or the words will also be on the screen. Luke chapter 8, starting with verse 40. Now when Jesus returned from the other side of the lake, the crowd welcomed him, for they were all waiting for him. Just then there came a man named Jairus, a leader of the synagogue. He fell at Jesus' feet and begged him to come to his house, for he had an only daughter, about 12 years old, who was dying. As he went, the crowds pressed in on him. Now there was a woman who had been suffering from hemorrhages for 12 years. And though she had spent all she had on physicians, no one could cure her. She came up behind him and touched the fringe of his clothes, and immediately her hemorrhage stopped. Then Jesus asked, Who touched me? When all denied it, Peter said, Master, the crowd surround you and press in on you. But Jesus said, Someone touched me, for I noticed that power had gone out from me. When the woman saw that she could not remain hidden, she came trembling and falling down before him. She declared in the presence of all the people why she had touched him and how she had been immediately healed. He said to her, Daughter, your faith has made you well. Go in peace. While he was still speaking, someone from the leader's house Someone came from the leader's house to say, Your daughter is dead. Do not trouble the teacher any longer. When Jesus heard this, he replied, Do not fear. Only believe, and she will be saved. When he came to the house, he did not allow anyone to enter with him except Peter, John, and James, and the child's father and mother. They were all weeping and wailing for her, but he said, Do not weep, for she is not dead but sleeping. And they laughed at him, knowing that she was dead. But he took her by the hand and called out, Child, get up! Her spirit returned, and she got up at once. Then he directed them to give her something to eat. Her parents were astounded, but he ordered them to tell no one what had happened. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks, Thanks be to God. God. In this passage, we get two stories knit together with one theme, the contrast between fear and faith. This contrast is first seen in the contrast between the way the people on the opposite sides of the lake respond to Jesus. People on the other side of the lake, where the once demon-possessed man lived, were so afraid of Jesus that they asked him to leave them. But when Jesus returns to the Jewish side of the lake, the crowd welcomes him, for they are all waiting for him to come back. However, that doesn't necessarily mean that they were good soil, but at least they were not the soil on the path. More importantly, we see the contrast between fear and faith in both of these intertwined stories. Jesus, excuse me, Jairus fears that he will lose his only daughter, who is dying, and then later reported to be dead. But Jesus tells him, do not fear, only believe. She will be saved. And the woman with the hemorrhage comes trembling and falling down before Jesus when she realizes that Jesus knows that she touched him in order to be healed. 
She was probably afraid of how Jesus might react to her for touching him while she was bleeding, which according to the Jewish law made him ritually unclean. And she was probably also afraid of how the crowd would treat her when they found out what she had done because what she had done was socially unacceptable. But Jesus told her, Daughter, your faith has made you well. Go in peace. In both cases, the main character overcomes their fears through their faith in Jesus. And Jesus is faithful to meet their needs. As we study the intertwined stories of this passage, we might note several simil similarities. Both Jairus and the woman with the hemorrhage fell down at Jesus' feet. And we might also remember that the demon-possessed man also fell at Jesus' feet when he was possessed by the demons and then later sat at Jesus' feet after he was released from the demons. In each of these individuals, we find someone who acknowledges Jesus' power and submits to him as one who has the power to save them. As we worship this morning, is our attitude that of someone who has fallen at Jesus' feet? Do we know that he saves us? Do we submit to him as our Lord? Another similarity is found in the fact that Jairus' daughter is 12 years old and the woman has been suffering from hemorrhages for 12 years. Jesus restores life to Jairus' daughter and Jesus calls the woman whom he heals of the hemorrhage, daughter. Do you know yourself as a child of God? Another similarity that we might notice is the importance of touch in both of these healing miracles. The woman comes up behind Jesus and touches the fringe of his clothes and immediately her hemorrhage stops. And Jesus asks, who touched me? Peter points out that probably several people had touched Jesus because the crowd is pressing in on him. Jesus knew that someone had intentionally touched him in order to be healed. Then when Jesus arrives at Jairus' house, he takes the girl by the hand and calls out, Child, get up. And her spirit returns and she gets up at once. In both of these situations, physical touch seems to be an important element in the healing that Jesus brings. We often pray that God's healing touch will be felt by those that are suffering. We know that physical touch is healing. The fact that Jesus touched these two, the woman with the hemorrhage and the child who had died, is even more important if we understand that to do so was not acceptable in this culture. Both the woman who was bleeding and the dead child were unclean. To touch either of them would make Jesus ritually unclean. Good Jews would have avoided touching either of them. But Jesus did not hesitate to reach out and touch those that others considered unclean. Just as he had gone all the way across the lake to minister to the man in the unclean country who lived in the unclean tombs near the unclean pigs, Jesus reached out to touch the unclean woman and the unclean child to bring healing and to restore life. Jesus was willing to cross both religious and social barriers in order to reach out and touch those who needed his saving grace. And it's the same today. There is no boundary too high or too wide or too strong to keep Jesus from reaching out to touch us in our need. Imagine Jesus reaching out to touch you. Feel his healing touch. Know that he cares about your suffering and that he has the power to heal you whatever your need may be.
One last similarity in these intertwined stories that I want to bring to your attention is that both Jairus and the woman with the hemorrhage were facing a desperate situation. Jairus' daughter was dying and then reported to be dead. The woman had been suffering from hemorrhages for 12 years. She had spent all she had on physicians, but no one could cure her. And because of her bleeding, which made her unclean, and anyone who touched her to, would also become unclean, not only was she physically ill and financially depleted, she was an outcast in her own community. We can certainly see that both Jairus and the woman were facing a desperate situation. And both of them turned to Jesus, believing that he could save them. So, what kind of soil do you think Jairus and the woman with the hemorrhage represent? I think they're the good soil. The ones who, when they hear the word, hold it fast in an honest and good heart and bear fruit with patient endurance. Even though they each faced a desperate situation, neither of them gave up believing that Jesus could save them. And their faith did bear fruit. Jesus led the woman to tell the crowd what he had done for her so that she could be restored to the community because she was no longer unclean. Jairus and his wife did not need to tell that Jesus had saved their daughter, even though he told them not to tell. The living child was the testimony of that miracle. And so, what about you? What about me? What kind of soil are we? When our faith is tested, when we face a desperate situation, do we continue to believe that Jesus will meet our need, that he will save us? Do we hold fast to the word of God in an honest and good heart and bear fruit with patient endurance? And when Jesus meets our need, do we share what he has done for us with others? In the 1996 Summer Olympics, sprinter Michael Johnson set records in both the 200 and 400 meter races. Perhaps you remember that if you're an Olympic fan. To do this, he had trained for some 10 years to cut a mere second or two off of his time. In his book, Slaying the Dragon, Johnson writes, Success is found in much smaller portions than most people realize. A hundredth of a second here, sometimes a tenth there, can determine the fastest man in the world. At times we live our lives on a paper-thin edge that barely separates greatness from mediocrity and success from failure. Life is often compared to a marathon. But Johnson writes, I think it's more like being a sprinter. Long stretches of hard work punctuated by brief moments in which we are given the opportunity to perform at our best. The Christian life also resembles the life of a sprinter. Long stretches of obedience and spiritual discipline in order to allow the seed of God's word to take root and grow strong within us. And then occasional situations that test our faith. But if we are the good soil, the seed of God's word will have taken root and our faith will remain steadfast during those difficult times. And we will bear fruit with patient endurance. I pray this is true in your life and in mine. If you're facing a desperate situation today, come to the Lord's table to receive God's grace that will enable you to keep your faith even during this time of trial. If you're not facing a desperate situation today, come to the Lord's table to receive God's grace that will enable you to continue to grow in your faith 
so that your roots will be deep. And when your time of trial comes, you will be able to remain faithful. And you will bear fruit with patient endurance. Faith in Jesus Christ will see each one of us through when those times of trial come. Because each one of us will face times of trial. May our roots be deep.